everybody, I am Abby Elizabeth, and this is the Earthen Vessels YouTube channel. This is a channel for Christian women, but anyone is welcome to listen. Praise the Lord for another day that he has given us, wherein we can consider his word and speak his word and do the things that he says. Because we know that when we do the things that he says, we are healthy and we are blessed. Praise the Lord. These are difficult times that we're living in. There are many changes that are happening quickly. And I thought to address some of these things in a public video to edify those of you who love the Lord Jesus Christ and serve him in sincerity. Let's begin today in 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And let's read here starting in verse 12. May the Lord bless the reading of his word today. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. You see, a Christian is not someone, necessarily, who is very comfortable in this world. As a matter of fact, we, like our Lord Jesus was, are strangers in a strange land. And our walk is a narrow walk, and many people revile us. They, they call us evildoers. They, they call us heretics. They cast us from their presence, and we should not think that this is strange. Because the same things that are happening to us happened to our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to Matthew chapter 10. Let's read here in verse 25, starting in verse 25. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master. And if as the servant, and the servant, pardon me, and the servant as his Lord, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. You see, sometimes in this world we lose sight of the eternal things and fall into feeling very badly about what might be happening in a particular moment. But when we serve the Lord Jesus Christ and the living God, Almighty God, His Father and our Father, we know that the, the one who made heaven and earth knows all things, beholds all things, and He cares for us. He cares for us. Let's read a little bit further here in verse 28 now, Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very heads of your head, hairs... <laughs> The very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. So we are very precious unto our Father in heaven. And he beholds all things. And we have been purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You see, when God sent his Son into the world, to die for mankind's sin. It was in particular for those who would obey him. You see, Jesus Christ didn't die to save the entire world, everyone who's enjoying their sin. Rather, he gave people an opportunity to depart from sin and serve the living God in holiness, something that wasn't possible during the time of the Old Testament. So when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, 
and filled the disciples, the 120 disciples who were waiting in the upper room with the spirit of the living God, then it became possible for disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ to walk in holiness and to serve Jesus Christ in the way that God always wanted. He wanted us to have his law written on our hearts and do what he said without becoming rigid and controlling the way the Pharisees had been. You see, the law of God is good. It's good to be obedient unto the Father. But when we try to do it through our flesh, what happens is we end up becoming somewhat hypocritical. So the outside is clean, but the inside is filthy. But when we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins, the inside of the cup is then clean. And we are able to walk in holiness. This is the gift of Jesus Christ, what he did for us on the cross. Because as I've said before, and I'll say it until the day I die, sin hurts people. It hurts the sinner and it hurts people around them. And when we continue in sin, we can't please God. But Jesus Christ made it so that we would be able to please our Father and inherit everlasting life in his kingdom. Now I want to read a little bit further. Let's begin now in verse 34. It says, and this is Jesus Christ speaking here. Think not that I'm come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they, of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. I'm going to read this particular part again. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Taking up one's cross is not to be prosperous and popular or famous or powerful. Taking up one's cross is doing what Jesus Christ did, which means that he laid down his life in obedience unto his Father so that many could inherit everlasting life in his kingdom. Christians do the same thing. They walk as their their master walked. They do as he did. And when they do that, people will hate us. They hate us. Those of us who walk in holiness, who speak the truth, we are reviled as our master was reviled. We are called names as he was called names. The religious people who aren't bought by the blood of the Lamb, who have not been baptized in the name of the Lord, think that people who are walking in holiness and obedience to the word of God are legalistic, are Pharisees, are judgmental, are hateful. So I want to read a little bit further now. I want to go now to, uh, pardon me, Pardon me, let's go to, um, I want to read again verse 25. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call him, them of his household? So here we can see that a Christian is not someone that gets along with everybody. We're kind to everybody, but part of being kind is telling the truth. You see, it's not kind to see someone about to get hit by a bus and stand by and say there, you just keep going there, dear. You're all right, don't worry. And you see, that's what religious authorities do these days. They tell people who have not obeyed the gospel who are yet living in iniquity, compassionate things, 
sympathetic things, things that flatter them. And the reason why religious authorities do this isn't because they have the best interest of the person who's about to end up in the lake of fire should they perish in that condition. You see, their, their mind is not on the well-being of that person. Their mind is upon paying for their building, lining their pockets, having a lot of people attending their gatherings. Now, I want to make a comment about the false church. The false church claims to be Christian, but they don't know Jesus Christ. Most of them worship a Jesus Christ that is not found in the Holy Bible, an entity that comes from Babylon known as God the Son. There is no God the Son in the scripture. God the Father is the only true God, and that's what Jesus Christ himself said in John chapter 17 and verse 3. But in many places it's written in the scripture that there is but one God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, the Lamb of God, the Lamb that was slain. You see, you can't slay a God. And when people say that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was God the Son, they're turning him into something that is worshipped throughout the world in every pagan nation. It's known as the Trinity. Whether you're talking about uh, Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz, or you're talking about Horus and Isis and, and, and you know, the, all these, these false gods that have existed since before the flood are fallen angels and they have nothing to do with our Father in heaven and Jesus Christ, his Son. You see? But people who believe this and, and they, they think that they're righteous because they have the things of this world. So the, the prince of darkness, the prince of the power of the air, the prince of this world has given them things of this world to convince them that their prosperity means that they're blessed. But Jesus Christ, when he walked on this earth, did not have a place to lay even his own head. He was not a rich man. He was not a powerful man. He wasn't popular either. People sometimes wanted his the things that he could provide, such as, as uh, food in the wilderness, bread and, and, and fish and so forth. He could do that. He could heal people. But we also remember that when Jesus walked to the cross, all the people were calling for him to die. They had turned on him. So it is also that way with Christians. There are many who want what we have. They want to, to be comforted. They want to be blessed by the word of God, but they don't want to obey it. And when it comes time for a Christian to lay down their life in faith, they will probably face doing so when people are hating them. When people are hating them. So, brethren, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. Now let's go to John chapter 15. John chapter 15 and verse 18. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But ye are... Because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. You see, there's many people these days who don't understand the truth about salvation. And as we're beginning to walk through very different times, so people who are in the false religion, who have been very comfortable in their iniquity and in their idolatry, are, are now facing things that they don't know how to handle because they don't know the Lord. 
When we're a Christian, we realize that the price of everlasting life is obedience unto death. And they don't know this. They've been serving the God of this world and getting the blessings of this world. And now that those things are going away, they have nothing left. Now we who are Christians, we carry the light of Jesus Christ with us wherever we go. So when we speak the truth unto some of these people will hear it. Not all of them will. Some of them will throw rocks at us and call us names. But we don't have to worry about that. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And let's read here verse 11. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Have you been accused, my sisters? Have people called you a legalist? Have people called you a judgmental and unkind because you've had the courage to testify unto them about what Jesus Christ can really do for someone? that the Jesus Christ of the Bible understands that people need deliverance from their sins and has provided a way for them to be delivered from their sins. But the, the sinners in the false church in particular can't stand it when we point out that sin needs to be departed from, repentance. And then we once we've repented, which means to turn away from iniquity, that then we can turn towards the Savior, Jesus Christ, and be baptized in his name. The name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost is Jesus Christ. It is the only name given amongst men whereby we can be saved. But they deny that because they worship three gods and not one. They think that we are a heretic and they hate us. So they love their sin. They don't want to read or obey the word of God. And when someone is walking in holiness and offers them the light of salvation, they think that person is evil and they call us names. So it's the same as what happened to the Lord. Now let's read in verse 11 about how it is that we overcome. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto the death. So how does a Christian overcome? Do they overcome by getting political power, by having a huge savings, by piling up gold and silver, stockpiling weapons perhaps, forming groups and, and ha having um, unity, attending church? Is that what Christians do? Well, there's not, no such thing as attending church in the Bible. We are the church. And yes, we gather with one another, but going to a building and sitting underneath the authority of a religious person who's telling us religious lies in order to line his pockets, no, Christians don't do that. You see, we overcome the accuser of the brethren we, the accuser of the brethren is Satan. So those who accuse us of being mean and hateful and judgmental and legalistic, those who are, accuse us are of their father, the devil. You see, just like the Pharisees accuse Jesus Christ of being a blasphemer, they will accuse us of being blasphemous. And we overcome this one, this, the, the, the prince of this world, we overcome him by the blood of the lamb. And the way that the blood of the lamb is applied to a, a person is when they're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. Remission of sins comes by the blood. And the way that our sins are remitted is when we're washed of our sins by being baptized in that most precious name of Jesus Christ, who died for us when he didn't deserve to die. 
You see, we love him for that. We realize what it is he did for us. And we are not willing to compromise at all with people who want to tell religious lies. So when they cast us from their presence, when they say that we're mean or that we're legalistic or that even that we're stupid or that we're heretics, then, then we depart from them because we're not of them. We're not of this world. We overcome the accuser by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. So what is our testimony? We tell people what it is that Jesus Christ did for us. And a lot of people, when we do so, will think, oh, you think you're holier than everybody else. And you sin too. They'll say all kinds of things like that. But when we speak the truth to people in love and humility about what Jesus Christ did for us, then that's not being proud or hypocritical at all. It's simply telling the truth. So we tell them that we're not sinning anymore because we've been delivered by the blood of the Lamb. And that's what saves us. That's what saves us. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Jesus Christ said, so let's go back, back to Matthew 10. Matthew 10. He said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. The word of God says that precious in his sight is the death of his saints. And as our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, walked to the cross willingly, obediently, he was willing to die in obedience, so it is that we are also. My sisters, these are, these are difficult times because people are frightened and they're angry and they want answers and they don't want to hear the answers that are true. They want solutions, but they don't want to repent. They don't want to seek Jesus Christ, most of them. But we still tell them the truth because we're not of this world. Our kingdom is not of this world. We don't love the things in the world. Rather, we love God. We serve God in spirit and in truth. And we follow Jesus Christ, our master. We do as he did. And so when we speak the truth and love to people, every now and then there will be somebody who can hear it. And then we can have fellowship with that individual, whoever they may be. We don't have fellowship with people in the false church who like to have rock concerts and picnics and church suppers and, and, and coffee gatherings and pie festivals and, and, and so on and so forth. We gather together with those who truly love the Lord, who are also doing what we're doing and walking on the narrow way. We all realize, though, that there might come a time when we walk alone to our cross. So that's the point of this video, though, is that we're not even alone then. Let's go to John chapter 16 and verse 32 to read about what Jesus said about, about being alone. Pardon me. John chapter 16, verse 32. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now, now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because my Father is with me. These things 
have I, I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You see, Jesus Christ, when he walked to the cross, there was no one with him. There was no one helping him. But his Father was with him, you see. And when we walk to our cross, whatever that might be, whatever the, our cross looks like when we walk to it, it might feel to us as if we're alone if we don't remember what Jesus Christ said. So let's go to Matthew 28. Matthew chapter 28. And let's start here in verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. And lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. You see, the people who don't know the name of the Lord, they don't know that the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is Jesus Christ. Don't know the way of salvation. And so they tell people all they have to do is say a sinner's prayer or make a decision for Christ or accept Jesus Christ into their heart. And therefore, they're not able to walk in holiness. And so when someone knows the truth about salvation and knows the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and teaches that way of salvation, as Jesus Christ is commanding here, that when they tell them that they're able to do whatsoever Jesus Christ commanded, when we teach them that, they think that we're hateful. They think that we're hypocrites. They think we're judgmental, you see, because they don't know God and they don't know Jesus Christ. And they will persecute us. But we don't have to worry about that because the Lord is with us. He says here, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. You know, I would say the end of the world comes when you lay your body down in death. Many people at this point really are expecting that Jesus Christ is going to come and take his people from the earth before there's any real suffering. And that, that might happen to the bride, but it's certainly not going to happen to those who are in the harlot churches in the great whore of Babylon. But I would venture to say that it's pretty unreasonable to expect that because, you know, I live in the United States. We're pretty comfortable here. We have just about everything we need, even if we're considered to be poor. We are much wealthier than other places. We've had freedom, freedoms that other people don't have. And, you know, a Christian should not think themselves to be above their master. So why would a Christian expect not to have to suffer, not to have to walk alone to their cross, not to have to, su have to suffer contempt and reviling and name-calling and persecution, even persecution unto death. So we want to prepare ourselves, realizing that, yes, we've been comfortable for a very long time, most of us, and that's about to change. And we can take comfort in the fact that our Lord is with us. You know, I don't, if I were to contemplate uh, being persecuted unto death, being killed for the faith, it's very hard for me in the flesh to, to, to not be fearful of that. But if my eyes are on Jesus, if my heart is consumed with his word, then that will be but a fleeting moment a doorway through which I go, wherein I enter eternity. So Christians don't fear the ones that can kill the body. Rather, they fear God. 
And when we fear God, then we have wisdom, then we have strength, then we have blessings. Blessings that are the unseen blessings. Blessings in the heart, strength in the mind, peace. You see, when we are abiding in Jesus Christ and following him, then we have peace. So I want to go again now. Let's just go back to John to read this again about peace. John 16. And let's read here in verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You see, Jesus Christ overcame sin for us. So that those who were baptized in his name and filled with his spirit could also overcome the world because we've been purchased by his blood. We can walk in faith and holiness all the way to the end. And wherever that end might be, we can know that he is with us because he promised us that. I hope this message has been a blessing to you, those of you who love Jesus Christ in sincerity, feel free to email me or to comment in the comment section below. And may the word of the Lord go forth today and bless many. In Jesus' most precious name, amen.